Oh boy, do I have a bit of a rant to go on today. Today, as you saw, I will be reviewing Spiral from the Book of Saw that was just released a couple of days ago. If you're new here, my name is Kylie. Welcome to the channel. Glad to have you here in my little literal corner of the internet. Were you excited about Spiral? Because I sure was. Unfortunately though, as a lot of the reviews are starting to come in, the movie is just, it's not very good. So I am just about to get into it, but I wanna let you know that the first half of my videos are spoiler free and then I'll do a spoiler filled breakdown. So you're safe for a while and of course I'll warn you before I start to do my plot breakdown. And if you liked the movie, then you probably won't like this video. So disclaimers out of the way, let's just get started. So Spiral was released at least in my town on Thursday on May May 14th. It currently has a 44% on Rotten Tomatoes, and here's the synopsis. A criminal mastermind unleashes a twisted form of justice in Spiral, the terrifying new chapter from the Book of Saw. Working in the shadow of his father, an esteemed police veteran, brash detective Zeke Banks and his rookie partner take charge of a grisly investigation into murders that are eerily reminiscent of the city's gruesome past. Unwittingly entrapped in a deepening mystery, Zeke finds himself at the center of the killer's morbid game. Okay, so before I get into all my spoilers, free thoughts. I have just a couple of fun facts about the movie first. As most Saw fans are aware, Chris Rock is a fan of the Saw franchise and so he actually was the one that approached Lionsgate about starring in a new Saw movie. As a result, not only is he the lead of this movie, but he is also an executive producer and story writer. Chris Rock is also the second actor to write and star in a Saw film, the first being Lee Wannell in the very first Saw movie. The previous working title of this movie was The Organ Donor, which if you've seen the movie, even if you haven't, honestly, that title just makes no type of sense. The police basement vault door is designed by a company that was called Jules and Vincent, and this is a reference to the characters played by John Travolta and Samuel L. Jackson in Pulp Fiction, which that's a movie I still haven't seen. I really need to get on that. And finally, for my last fun fact, this was the only Saw movie not to be released in October. Now getting into my spoiler-free thoughts, I'm sure that a lot of my followers by now have seen the rating that I gave this movie on Letterboxd and... I'm sorry. I really hate to be the bearer of bad news with this movie, truly, but I am gonna talk about all the things that I liked about the movie first, but then I'm gonna rip it to shreds, so. The first thing that I have to praise is that the story was told from a very unique perspective. It definitely touched heavily on social commentary that's extremely relevant right now, especially with the whole movement that happened last year with BLM. And during those times in the movie when it was very much focused on the social commentary that it was making, that's when I found it to be the most interesting and I was like, wait, maybe this is the movie that I want to watch. And with how the rest of the movie came together, it almost feels like that was the movie that they wanted to make, but then they realized that they could throw in some traps and stuff and slap Saw onto the movie. I know that's not the case because Chris Rock approached Lionsgate and wanted to specifically make a Saw movie, but that's just how it feels. I really enjoyed that bit of the story because it just feels like a perspective that we don't often get to see, especially in horror. Chris Rock's character Zeke had previously ratted out a dirty cop, and so now he feels as though he can't trust a single person in his department. And I won't give away any more of the plot with that, but you can kind of see where that's heading and what kind of commentary that's making. I thought it was a really brutally honest take on what can happen in rotten police departments. I thought it was really interesting. And so the motive of the killer was also really interesting to me as well because it kind of tied into some of John Kramer's ideologies. And I always love when that happens, when you have an understanding of the villain and their motives. Obviously you don't approve of their methods, but you can kind of empathize with where they are coming from and so that's the case with the villain in this movie and when you can kind of understand where the villain is coming from I think it makes them a lot more dynamic because it definitely blurs the lines between good and bad people in the real world are not all good or all bad and so I really like it when villains are also often a mix of the two but there are still some major issues with that and the reveal but I'll get into that later but one other example of a villain whose motives you understand is actually from another Samuel L. Jackson movie and my favorite action movie of all time Kingsman the Secret Service. In that movie, Samuel L. Jackson's character has a plan to basically wipe out most of humanity because of climate change. So you obviously don't agree with his methods of getting rid of most of the population of humans, but you understand where he's coming from because climate change is a very pressing and important issue. So there was kind of a similar vibe to the villain in Spiral, which I really did appreciate. Unfortunately, I only really have one more positive about the movie, and it's not even really a full positive, but the ending of the movie did shock me. Not the big reveal, 
but literally the very last minute of the movie. I didn't really like it, but it was very intense and I kind of was a little bit shocked when the credits rolled, so I'll give them that. But so much about this movie is bad. It is difficult, sir. Don't be wonders where to begin. Let's just start with discussing the style of the movie. I will never disparage a movie for trying to go for a unique color scheme, so thank you Spiral for trying, but the lighting in this movie was just not it. Something I like to do when I have a unique or crazy kind of color scheme in a shot is I like to establish a light source so it at least kind of makes sense. In that way it just makes it feel more natural. In fact, we're gonna be using this little night light in my upcoming short film. Okay, I would have to turn off all the lights for you to see how red this is, but it's a very red night light. There, up close you can kind of tell. I just feel like using little things like this justifies when you have kind of a crazy color scheme going on. Spiral didn't try in the slightest to establish why they had all these crazy colors going on. They had a lot of teal, they had a lot of red, and they had a lot of blue. And the only one that I really enjoyed was the teal because it kind of started to feel like we were getting back to the roots of Saw and that aesthetic. The red and blue just felt a little bit out of place to me, especially given the kind of sickly, grimy green of the original franchise. And I just think that it would have better paid homage to the originals if they had just stuck with one color scheme, specifically the greens and teals. I also have several more gripes with the lighting because our two leads in this movie, Samuel L. Jackson and Chris Rock, they're black. And for several shots, they just look like they're straight up silhouettes or you can't even see a single contour of their face. They just look so flat. So it just tells me that the lighting department was setting up the lights for the environment and not for the actors. This is frustrating because visually it's kind of hard for your eyes to focus on what's going on because you need your actor to stand out from the background. The lighting just looked really, really rushed. And like I said, they never really established any light sources or anything. They would just have a massive red fill light in the background and you're like, okay, I guess that looks cool, but also Chris Rock kind of looks like a silhouette right now and I have no idea why there would be a bright red light in the sewer. Otherwise, stylistically, I, the cinematography was fine. It wasn't anything crazy. It felt like it was fitting for a Saw movie. It's, it just was what it was. They also kind of went back to the classic Saw style with a lot of crazy whip pans and zooms and stuff on the traps. On that note, let's maybe move on and talk about the traps because they were, uh, how you say, lame. Basically, all of them just revolved around losing a body part or you die. There were a couple other ones in there, but really they were all just the same flavor and they were all very bland. At this point, yeah, the story is important and they had an interesting kind of story going on with this movie, but the traps are equally as important. Often the traps will tell their own story throughout the other Saw movies. And it kind of leads me to believe that maybe the Saw franchise has been bled dry, but I don't really want to believe that because some of the traps in the past have been so far out there. I think with the right mind on the project, there are still so many different avenues to take with traps. There are an infinite number of ways to torture the mind and body. So I'm like, you couldn't have tried just a little bit harder. It just seems like the people that are currently involved with the franchise have been tapped out. Like Darren Lynn Bowsman, I feel like his time is kind of up. Lee Wan L and James Wan were also executive producers on this movie and uh, it's beyond me why those men were comfortable signing off on this crap. Like, they have made some of the most iconic horror movies in the genre's history, and they were fine having their name attached to this. I know they were just executive producers, so that could mean any number of things that could have just been investors in the project. And so maybe if they're just in their bag and they had no creative hand on the movie, then I respect that. I just know that they can do better and I expect better from them, honestly. Like they're super creative, brilliant men. And so the fact that the traps were so dull just utterly shocked me. It was such a hindrance to the movie because the social commentary they were making was so potent. And then they would go back and forth from that to these really lackluster traps. So the juxtaposition of that was just kind of laughable. The very first one I thought was good. They kind of started off with the bang, but they just progressively got worse. And even that first one was still leagues below a lot of the original traps. Also with the traps, oh my god, this, <laughs> this infuriated me. With the traps comes the tapes and you either watch them or you listen to them and just please listen to this fucking voice. Hello, Detective Banks. Do you know where your officers are? One of the most iconic parts of the Saw movies, in my opinion at least, is John Kramer himself and specifically his voice. The way it comes out so gravelly and deep and it's his true voice and he's just laying down the rules and you know you have no choice but you're playing his game. That's the way his voice kind of commands me at least. To go from this... You don't know me, but I know you. 
to this. Hello, Detective Banks. Embarrassing. So that was just absolutely comedic and dumb. Speaking of things that I laughed at in this movie, so Chris Rock, with peace and love, peace and love, I would consider either getting intensive training for your next drama or horror role, or just stick to comedy. We like you there. You are a wildly talented man. However, I do not believe that those talents extend to drama and horror. And that's fine, but let's maybe recognize that, dial it back, get some training training for next time, or just don't let there be a next time. I know that's harsh, but here are my reasons for saying those things. And also, I apologize to my audience because if you haven't seen the movie, I'm about to mention something that I don't think you'll be able to unsee. So in any situation where he would have to act scared or intense or mad, Chris Rock would just bulge his eyes out of his head. And me and the girlies in the theater, we were cracking up. <laughs> because those moments were not supposed to be funny, we were supposed to be feeling something intense with him and empathizing with him and oftentimes we would have an extreme close-up of his face. When it's Chris Rock just looking at you like I just, I couldn't. The girlies were laughing. I also don't feel like Samuel L. Jackson was putting that much effort into his role, and I mean, he's a very talented actor. He's been recognized at the Academy level, but I feel like his character was just never really nailed down. He had maybe, like, 10 minutes of screen time total. He just wasn't given very much focus in the movie, and I feel like because his screen time was so short, they probably could have gotten all of his coverage in a matter of a couple days. So just when it came down to everything, with the lighting as well, and with Samuel L. Jackson, Jackson and his performance, everything just felt so rushed. The acting in general in this movie too is just not a vibe. I mentioned earlier how I dug the motivations of the killer, but the person that they chose, not it. They really did not have a killer's energy in my opinion. The reveal was really weak with them, and I also actually called it 30 minutes before it happened. It was so painfully obvious and predictable, but I'll get into that when I do the plot breakdown. And that actually ties into my last topic of the spoiler-free section. Just in general, the writing was bad. So, on that topic, Chris Rock is a comedian, and I do think that comedy has its place in horror. It's like Stephen King always says. Humor and horror are really two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. You know, I always say... Uh, it stops being funny when it starts being you. So I typically find that comedy works in horror, but in this movie, the humor was so awful, and I guarantee it's because I feel like I've heard about 90% of those jokes before. They were all so very topical and current jokes, like, oh, having a happy wife is impossible. Oh, having a wife is so hard. Enjoy a lot less. So maybe the poor writing is why we got some less than stellar performances, I'm not really sure, but the writing was bad. It was predictable and bad. And to make matters worse, so much of the story was just padding. Like, why in the very beginning of the movie do we need a whole rant about Forrest Gump? Not only that, not only was there story filler and fluff and random dialogue that had no place, It's too f***ing hot here for me to listen to this I got a heat wave going on. We got rolling blackouts. The city is nuts. Stop! But they still had to throw in a lot of transition shots that just didn't make any sense with the movie. One of them included a slow motion shot of children playing with a fire hydrant. Like... Por qué? Or there was a whole scene where Chris Rock's character was just staring out a window when they were playing a bunch of flashbacks of previous scenes. Sorry, I didn't mean to hit you. Why was that there? I mean, like, there was no context, and I understand what they were trying to do. They were trying to give us a literal glimpse into his mind. But given everything that had been happening in the story, why are you spoon-feeding us? I'm pretty sure I would know what was going on in his mind. A lot of those filler shots just, they didn't make any type of sense. They just ended up confusing the hell out of me. And if you took out that, if you took out all the unnecessary dialogue, the unnecessary joking, and stuff like that, this movie probably could have been trimmed down a solid 15 minutes. So speaking of the plot, it's time to get into that in even more detail with the plot breakdown. So yeah, we're gonna get into some spoilers now, so if you haven't seen the movie yet, then click off, and after you go see it, then come back to my video. Although, I might not recommend spending your money on this movie. If you're the type of person that needs to budget and it really matters what you spend your money on, maybe skip this one. From the people that I know that have seen it, I honestly have not heard a single good thing about it. So yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's gonna be people out there that will vouch for this movie. I just think with everything that I've mentioned, that's kind of a subjective thing. Like if you come from a film background, all that stuff and the poor filmmaking can be really distracting. But if those are things that you wouldn't typically notice, then you, you might like the movie. Like it might have some good entertainment value for you. But if you're a diehard fan of the Saw franchise, I guarantee this movie will disappoint you. I, I guarantee it. So anyways, let's get into the plot. So the cold 
cold open, as I mentioned, I think had my favorite trap of the entire movie. But at the same time, as a whole, the cold open just felt very disjointed from the rest of the movie because we just have this nameless cop that chases someone down a sewer. Okay, I keep saying sewer, but I'm pretty sure that I mean like the subway system. I said it earlier and I'm pretty sure that I meant warehouse, but like whatever. The, it all, it looks like a sewer, okay? It like they're underground, whatever. He gets strung up by his tongue and then splattered by a subway train and really the only dialogue he has is like, hey, stop, police. Typically in a lot of the Saw movies, there will be multiple or a group of people that will wake up all together in a trap. And then we spend a good while kind of determining who these characters are and why or if they actually deserve to be there in the first place. The traps are extremely grand and well thought out and they often always have like their own storyline. Sometimes they include multiple rooms. I love when there's also drama between the characters because oftentimes the victims will get really heated and they'll turn on each other sometimes. It just makes for a really good drama. And I always find that the story with the trap is equally as important as what's going on with the police. Typically there is a very strong tie-in and a lot of times they're timed. So that definitely adds a lot more suspense because the police officer that's trying to track these people down usually only has like an hour to find them. Spiral said, nah. Spiral said, we're just gonna sprinkle in little death scenes here and there with a bunch of unrelated traps. No continuous storyline pertaining to the traps. They are only going to serve as torture porn death scenes. Then after being first on that scene, Zeke is assigned a new rookie cop whose name is William Schenk. I'm just gonna call him Will. And they have to go investigate the crime scene and they basically immediately come to the conclusion that it is a jigsaw copycat. Zeke gets sent to the courthouse where he finds a box with a little present and there's a tongue inside of it. And soon after that, there is another man that gets thrown into a trap. His name is Detective Finch and we find out that he once refused to offer backup to Zeke and that resulted in Zeke getting shot and almost dying. And his trap is so lame. I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but it was lame. This one I would say is probably the second lamest of the whole movie. Maybe third lamest. They're all bad. But his fingers are caught Chinese finger trap style and then he has this giant kind of contraption on his head for seemingly no reason. Maybe it was on his head so he had something to bite down on when his fingers got ripped off. I'm not sure. But it's not really part of the trap because essentially the trap is that he's in this big tub and it's filling up with water and there's some copper wiring there. So he has to rip all his fingers off before the water fills up and he gets electrocuted to death. I think they just gave him that helmet kind of thing to have more of a saw vibe. I don't really know. But it just feels so lazy and I couldn't really put my finger on why, but I think it's because there wasn't really a good method of escape. It doesn't even seem like escaping was an option either because this contraption was not pulling his fingers off fast enough for him to get out of there before the water filled up. And also all the people in the traps don't try very hard to escape. Like I know it would be awful to try to rip your tongue off, but I would much prefer that to getting my whole body splattered by a subway train. I would also prefer to lose all my fingers to dying. So even if the traps aren't impossible to escape, the people don't seem to try very hard to escape them. And so they end up not feeling like trap scenes at all. They just feel like complicated torture porn death scenes, which just feels so anti-Saw-like in its concept. Anyways, as he's done, a box arrives for Zeke at the police station and it's a piece of his partner's forearm skin that has been peeled off. It was strangely at this moment that I identified Will as the killer, the man whose skin was found in the box. Because his death was just so abrupt, I was like, mm, no. Then my suspicion was basically confirmed by the following scene. Basically all the cops in this department head down to a butcher shop where his body is and they find him all skinned and dead. But here's the thing. When they had arrived at the other crime scene, there was often a flashback that showed the person going through the trap and showed them dying. And with Will, they didn't show his face at all. With the other people, you know, it showed them waking up in the trap, going through the emotions of being in the trap and dying. With Will, no such thing happened. They only showed his dead body being skinned. Oh, and you didn't see his face. So immediately, without seeing his face and getting the confirmation that it was him who died, I was like, oh, so he's obviously the killer. Anyways, kind of need to backtrack and move along with the plot. While they're all distracted by Will's death, Garza is still back at the station and she goes down to the evidence lock and oh no, she gets trapped too. She has by far the lamest trap of them all. Her choice is either get killed by the scalding hot wax pouring on her face or severing her own spinal cord. 
Lame. Are you starting to see how basically every single trap is just lose body part or die? Whether it's your tongue or your fingers or your ability to walk, there's just not really any imagination to this movie. After that, Banks gets captured and he wakes up in this warehouse or whatever it is. And this part of the movie was in the trailer when he's sitting up and he wakes up and he finds a saw, which is just like the one from the original Saw movie. And when I saw the trailer, that had me so excited because I was like, oh my God, call back to the original film. Let's go! And then not 10 seconds after he starts to try to saw himself free from the handcuffs, he just finds a bobby pin. He just, he just takes the bobby pin and he frees himself and the saw never comes back into play. Lame Easter egg, you should have done something with the saw. Like if you're gonna tease us with that in the trailer especially and get our hopes up, at least make the saw mean something. Anyways, after that, someone just gets strung up and pelted with a bunch of glass. This was Zeke's ex-partner who murdered a witness. He was the dirty cop that Zeke turned in. And it's like, okay, how is this even a trap? The guy in the trap, Pete or whatever, he he had no control over the situation. And the whole point of John Kramer's ideology is that he gives people a fighting chance because he wants to see if they have the survival instinct. He wants to know, can they make a great sacrifice in the name of self-preservation? With this trap, it's just like, how much is Zeke willing to get pelted by glass to save a murderer? I don't get it. So then after that, he wanders around and then he finds Will still alive. It's supposed to be this big moment. They even have some music there and it's like, dong. And mind you, we're in the theater and when they did that reveal, I was like, huh? Is that who I think it is? Sorry, I couldn't find footage of this, but basically it was just an extra wide shot and you couldn't see who it was at all. Then I think they cut back to Chris Rock and then they finally cut back to him in a close up and I'm like, oh yeah, okay, it is who I thought it was. Here is where the story started to get interesting again because we have Will and he's kind of explaining all of his motives. He's trying to clean up the police department. He also kind of went over the metaphor of what the spiral means to him and how that ties into John Kramer's ideology. It was really fascinating, but I don't like him as the villain. I just found him to be extremely weak. He also didn't really play it up at all. I think this might have been the result of poor direction. I'm not sure, but his line delivery was so bland. Just delivered with such a dryness. Then we have our final reveal with Zeke's dad and he's all tied up and losing blood. And then instead of immediately shooting his father down, he's like, you know what? I'm gonna have a little conversation with Will. I have to say when they revealed the kind of puppet imagery from one of the previous tapes and how that mirrored what his dad was going through and being all strung up with the gun and stuff, I thought that was shocking. And I like that that was kind of tied together. I thought it was cool that it was foreshadowed, but I do have a problem with it. I don't like that they did the flashback to the videotape. I don't like that it was an exact mirror shot and they were basically just like, here comes the spoon. This was also not the first time the movie was super guilty of spoon feeding us. But anyways, this was probably the most egregious time because they essentially gave us an entire recap of all the most important events of the movie and literally every single moment that foreshadowed to the end of the movie. One thing that's so fun about watching psychological horror in particular is the fact that they do often include a lot of foreshadowing and a lot of little Easter eggs, but they're so fun to include because then you can pick up on them on a rewatch. I think it's what gives these kinds of movies rewatchability and Jordan Peele is a master of this with Get Out and Us. So when you just spoon feed the audience, just letting them know exactly where every little moment of foreshadowing was, at the end of the movie, what incentive do I have to watch this movie again? It wasn't a good enough movie for me to want to rewatch it, so the only reason that I would have wanted to is to pick up on all those little Easter eggs. So that was just really frustrating, and maybe I honestly wouldn't have even rewatched it anyways because I saw who the killer was like 30 minutes before they did the reveal. It was just poorly written, predictable, not well made, it felt rushed, the lighting was bad, the jokes were stupid. A lot about this movie was just so awful. The one thing that I do appreciate that I'm gonna reiterate is I do think the social commentary was very relevant, I enjoyed that a lot. I thought it was really interesting. The perspective that the movie was told from was also really interesting. As I mentioned, just like everything else about this movie was so bad. So there you have it. That does it for the plot breakdown. The movie ended on that really upsetting note of Zeke's father being shot and whatever. Literally the credits rolled like immediately. But the reason why the ending was so upsetting was mainly because both our protagonist and antagonist both survived. So who's ready for the next Spiral movie? Not me. So I hope that you found some enjoyment in in this fairly negative review. I don't typically make rant videos like this. It's just that the movie was genuinely so bad that this was kind of necessary. It was just such a disappointment in like every single way. If it wasn't a follow-up to such an amazing and well-constructed franchise, maybe I wouldn't have been so hard on it. Well, no, I think I would have found the traps to be less lame, but everything else that I said still holds up. It's just a poorly made movie in general. So there's that. There are all my thoughts on Spiral. Did you have fun today? I did. If you want to see some more positive, 
positive content though, I do have oodles of positive content on my channel. I also have a vlog channel and on my Patreon this month, I'm gonna be uploading my reaction to the first seven Saw movies because I recently watched all of them for the first time except for the first one. So if you'd like to support me there, that'll be linked down below. There's also a lot of miscellaneous content on my vlog channel. But on this channel, the next time that you see me, I'll probably be ranking the entire Saw fries. So, Saw fries the Holt. <laughs> I'll be ranking the entire Saw franchise, so stick around. If you're new here, definitely subscribe, click the notification bell so you can find out where Spiral falls on my Saw ranking. And other than that, all my social media will be linked down below. I've been posting some teasers and some updates about my short film, so it's all fun stuff. I hope that you enjoyed this video, and I hope I catch you in the next one. Bye!